Good morning, everyone. Woo. Okay, woke myself up with that. I'm Peg Esper, and I'm going to run through a few of the housekeeping issues before we actually get started. So if I can have your attention, everyone. I would like to welcome you to this educational program, Metastatic Melanoma, an oncology nurse workshop on novel treatments, adverse event management, and patient education. This activity is being sponsored by IMER, the Institute for Medical Education and Research, and is supported by an independent grant from Bristol Myers Squibb. And I don't typically take the time to do this during these presentations, but I do want to really acknowledge the work that IMER does. Keith Whitener and his group, they do a phenomenal job putting these meetings together, and I certainly appreciate being involved in this. There were, yeah, thank you. Sign-in sheets, I, I don't think any of you were able to get into the room without getting scanned, but if for some reason you missed signing in, please make sure that you do sign in. You will receive credit for this activity. It's 1.5 contact hours. You are also part of research that's going on by IMER, so there are going to be assessments during this program. This helps them to evaluate what the knowledge level is of those in attendance and, and plan for future activities. So you will be asked to do some pre- and post-assessment questions. I'll be asking you some demographic questions. And um, you have your IRS keypads on the table, so if you haven't already grabbed one of those, please take the time now to grab one of those keypads so that you'll be able to answer the questions as we go. You will be receiving your attendance certificate at the completion of this session, but you will need to complete your evaluation that's in that folder you were given when you came in. So please make sure that you complete that and uh, put all the information on there. And those evaluations really are critical. Those of us who are speakers, we love to get the feedback and find out what we can do to make our presentations better. And it also helps them plan for future sessions as well. Uh, you should have received your little USB stick, and that will have all the information from the, from the lectures that we're doing, and we'll also have some clinical tools on there for you that will not be part of the lecture, but I think you're going to find very helpful in your practices. As a last reminder, and I know that uh, I, you hear this every time, but please remember to turn off your cell phones and pagers or place them on vibrate. All right, so again, evaluations, evaluations, evaluations. Our little disclaimer here and our disclosures for unlabeled Jews, I'm not going to take the time to read these to you this morning. The conflicts of interest are disclosed here. for each of our presenters. Here are our learning objectives. We will be looking at the emerging role of novel therapies in treating advanced melanoma, implementing strategies for safe administration of novel therapies, looking at evidence-based practice or best practice to help manage the side effects for our patients, and looking at providing accurate and health literate responses to the patient's questions regarding their disease, treatment guidelines, and side effects. I'm going to be starting with the demographic questions, but I want to make sure that I introduce to you our speakers. Krista Rubin, to my immediate left, is a nurse practitioner. She's at the Center for Melanoma Thanks, at um, Mass General. And Dr. Evan Hirsch is at um, Arizona Cancer Center at the University of Arizona, a professor of medicine there, microbiology and immunology. So we have folks up here as faculty that have a wealth of experience with this disease, and I think you're going to learn a lot from these presentations. Here's our activity agenda, and that is also in the packets that you've been given. All right, starting with the demographic questions. Who are you? We want to know who you are. Who's here with us today? So please respond by saying which best describes your primary practice setting. Community inpatient, community outpatient, academic institute, institution inpatient, academic institution outpatient, or a private physician practice. Right, just push the button for the number you selected. So we have a nice mixture of folks here, so that's great. All right, and which best describes your primary nursing role? Academic educator, case manager, clinical nurse specialist, clinical trials nurse, 
medical science liaison, navigator, patient educator, nurse practitioner, staff nurse, or other. Okay, so most of you are staff nurses, nurse clinicians. Excellent. In a typical month, how many patients with melanoma do you see? 1 to 5, 6 to 10, 11 to 15, 16 to 20, 21 to 25, more than 25, or you don't see patients with melanoma in your practice. I kind of like to hear the rest of that song, sorry. <laughs> okay, so most of you see a, a relatively small number, 80% um, of you see less than, or 10 or less per month. And here are practice pattern research questions. How often have you been involved with the care of patients receiving anti-CTLA-4 antibody therapy? Never, less than five times, five to ten times, or more than ten times? Okay, I promise we're getting close to the end here and you'll be able to finish eating your breakfast. <laughs> okay, so large number of you have never been involved with these patients, so that's great because then you're really going to get some good information today. How often have you been involved with the care of patients receiving BRAF inhibitor therapy? Again, never less than five times, five to ten times, or greater than ten times. Okay, so less than five times for um, about 35% of you then, and 60% of you have never given BRAF inhibitor therapy. So uh, again, that's, that's wonderful because uh, that's why we want you here this morning. What is the most common immune-related adverse event seen in your practice? Diarrhea, endocrinopathies, autoimmune hepatitis, hypophysitis, skin rash, nausea and vomiting, or we do not see any immune-related adverse events in my practice. Okay, so we're kind of split up around the board there, but skin rash seems to be the most popular there. All right, so I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Evan Hirsch at this point, and he's going to be doing the treatment update in advanced melanoma. Good morning. This is really an exciting time in malignant melanoma in the United States and around the world. So the first question that we have is which of the following treatments for melanoma are considered immunotherapies? Temozolomide or Dacarbazine, interleukin-2, vemurafenib, ipilimumab, all of the above. Two to four, two, three, and four. Okay. <laughs> the correct answer is. No, don't tell him yet. Oh, oh, okay. Sorry. He really wants to teach you this morning. <laughs> The, the next question is, which of the following is possible treatment choice for a patient who tests negative for the BRAF V600E gene mutation? Temozolomide or DTIC, vemurafenib, ipilimumab, all of the above, one and three, two and three. Okay, now we'll start the presentation. Uh, melanoma is an extremely rapidly rising disease in the United States. It's estimated that 76,000 patients will get melanoma in 2012. Luckily, most cases are uh, discovered earlier, 
or early so that the mortality uh, remains relatively low. The median age at diagnosis is 60. The disease has a potential for early metastasis. Uh, uh, central nervous system metastases are quite common. At least 20 to 25 percent of patients during life and at post-mortem, it's more in the range of 60 percent. Uh, we've had very little to do for the disease, as you'll see in a few moments until recent years, and now we have several really active, promising therapies which are FDA approved and uh, the prognosis of patients with metastatic melanoma is indeed changing. The mortality has risen somewhat because of the dramatic increase in the number of cases. Uh, so in past years, it's been in the range of 7,500 to 8,500, and it's now up to about 9,000. Uh, this slide shows the increasing incidence of the disease over the last few years, or the last few decades, I should say, and you can see the steady rise, and this is due to the fact that the population has shifted from the cold, dark northeast to the warm, dry, sunny southwest. And in addition, we have more leisure time. We spend much more time in the sun. So curves like this are not dissimilar if you go to countries like Sweden, where everybody goes down to the Mediterranean and soaks up the rays in the winter. Mortality depends very closely on staging, as you can see uh, in the right-hand panel. So the patients with stage 4 disease, defined as distant metastases from the primary site, have a very poor prognosis. The systemic therapy for metastatic melanoma has uh, historically been, sur been surgery, surgical removal of the primary wide local excision, sentinel lymph node biopsy, uh, lymph node dissection. Decarbazine or DTIC was our standard of care for many, many years and has been the standard of care for most clinical trials up to the present time. High-dose interleukin-2 is the only curative therapy, systemic therapy for metastatic malignant melanoma. Uh, however, the number of patients who can be treated with this regimen is limited because it's highly toxic and it has cardiovascular, pulmonary, central nervous system, and other toxicities, so you basically have to have completely normal organ function, be under the age of 60, et cetera. Uh, but it is curative and should be thought of. Biochemotherapy with combination of four chemotherapeutic agents plus low-dose IL-2 has had some efficacy. Chiroplatin plus paclitaxel is widely used in the community. It has a low response rate and no effect on survival. Temozolomide is a first cousin of decarbazine. And it has, again, a low level of activity in the range of response of 10 percent with very little impact as a single agent on survival. And photomustine is not approved in the United States. So we'll first talk about ipilimumab. Uh, this is a monoclonal antibody directed at CTLA-4. And if you look from the left to the right on these three panels, you'll see how it interferes with the immune response. The, the basis of ipilimumab treatment is that everybody with melanoma has an anti-tumor immune, immune response, but it's almost always clinically ineffective when the patient develops metastatic disease. Consequently, we need something that will turn on the immune system to a much higher level. So in the first panel on the left, you can see the normal immune response where the tumor antigen is presented to the T cell, which drives T cell proliferation and the production of interleukin-2 and gamma interferon uh, by the T cell. Uh, it takes two signals between the T cell receptor and the major, histocombat major histocompatibility complex and between a second antigen on the T cell and an antigen on the antigen presenting cell or dendritic cell uh, called B7. And that starts the proliferation and production of cytokines. 
In the second panel, you see what happens over time, over the first couple of weeks of an immune response. It's an effort by the immune system to downregulate or control the immune response so it doesn't completely go off the scale. So consequently, the T cell re uh, expresses TCLA4, CTLA4, and consequently the immune system is downregulated because the second signal is blocked. Uh, epilimumab is a monoclonal antibody to CTLA4, as you can see in the third panel and um, it blocks CTLA-4, so the B7 antigen shifts back to a stimulatory mode, and the immune system goes on and keeps getting larger and larger. So this agent was shown to cure metastatic melanoma in mouse models, was translated into clinical trials, and we'll show you some of that information today. There have been two uh, epilimumab registration trials for second-line therapy. Uh, the agent was originally called MDX-010, and um, it was used in combination with a tumor antigen or used alone uh, compared to a placebo in patients uh, with second-line therapy, that is, they had failed on a prior therapy and had widely metastatic disease. In the second study that was done subsequently, the patients uh, had the same agent, uh, ipilimumab, but they were randomized to receive ipilimumab or DTIC for metastatic melanoma in the previously untreated setting. So this is the MDX-010 uh, second-line trial. Patients were randomized to ipilimumab, given at three milligrams per kilogram every three weeks for four doses, plus a tumor antigen vaccine, GP100, ipilimumab plus a placebo, or GP100 plus a placebo. And these are the results comparing uh, the ipilimumab arms to the tumor antigen alone arm, which is shown in red. And this is the overall survival. And you can see that there's a highly statistically significant improvement in survival with a hazard ratio of about 0.68. So an over 30% improvement in survival, highly significant as you can see from the p-values. This is the second study that was done that was reported about a year ago. And um, here the patients were randomized to ipilimumab at 10 milligrams per kilogram every three weeks, the standard regimen, plus DTIC or decarbazine, the standard chemotherapy given at 850 milligrams uh, intravenously every three weeks a regimen I'm sure that you're all quite familiar with. And after an induction period of 12 weeks, they could be maintained on ipilimumab alone on a every 12-week schedule. The placebo arm was an ipilimumab placebo plus DTIC uh, on the same uh, schedule. And here are the results. Uh, in terms of overall survival, and you can again see that there was a statistically significant improvement in survival among the patients who received ipilimumab as well as DTIC. So the critical issues for ipilimumab treatment are the adverse events, and we've already seen uh, something about that in the uh, preliminary questions. Uh, these slides show the data in terms of the two arms of the study and in terms of uh, all adverse events versus those that are grade three and four, because obviously grade one and two adverse events are, are not as of great concern. So dermatologic would include itching and rash. Um, GI would be diarrhea which can go on to colitis and even to GI perforation. And as you can, oops, as you can see, the, um, 
uh, quite a few of the patients developed uh, toxicity, 20 to 30 percent of the patients, but the grade 3 and 4 adverse events luckily were less than 5 percent. Hepatic toxicity is generally increased in, en in liver enzymes without rise in bilirubin or alkaline phosphatase. Uh, endocrine uh, adverse events, hypothyroidism, thyroiditis, hyper hyperthyroidism, and hypophysitis. These are often very subtle. You have to have your eyes and ears open to detect these. You should always, they're, they're rare as you can see, but you should always be looking for them because the patient can be complaining of symptoms that sound like the symptoms of a patient with cancer who's getting chemotherapy or who has advancing disease when they're actually suffering from uh, pituitary or thyroid in insufficiency. Now one of the interesting things about this agent, and you can deduce this if you think about the mechanism of action, is that it can have a very slow effect. So this is not cytotoxic chemotherapy. In other words, with cytotoxic chemotherapy, we look back at two, four, eight weeks, and if there's shrinkage, we think we have an effect, and if there's none, then we think we have no effect. But this is an immune response, and the immune response is ongoing, and it takes a long time for the immune cells to kill off uh, the tumor, and consequently uh, we see um, a very delayed effects, as you can see in this figure. So the other agent I'm going to talk about briefly today is uh, vemurafenib, uh, which targets a specific mutation, the V600E mutation, in the sequence of genes that are activated, uh, tyrosine kinases, et cetera, to, um, to um, uh, activate the cell to proliferation. That mutation puts the tumor cells in an on uh, position all the time so that if the patient has um, this gene mutation, the tumors proliferate uh, without stopping. The uh, control clinical trial that was done compared vemurafenib to decarbazine uh, for uh, tablets twice a day compared to the standard day carbazine. And here's the best tumor response by the individual patient. Uh, and as you can see uh, in this waterfall plot, the, the vemurafenib was highly active compared to the day carbazine. Uh, this shows the progression free survival in the study, and it's really dramatic. And what's interesting here is that since this stops the proliferation of tumor cells and they go into, um, uh, they go into um, apoptosis, uh, they, they, you can see a response in a week. So these are uh, some PET CT scans of the patients before and after treatment, and you can see the dramatic changes in these four panels. Um, there was a phase two study of vemurafenib, uh, which has survival data now. There were 132 patients, and you can see that the overall survival was 15.9 months compared to what you would see with decarbazine, which is about eight months, so a dramatic improvement. Uh, High-dose interleukin-2 is another active agent. Um, uh, this was a study that compared high-dose interleukin-2 with or without um, a tumor cell vaccine, 179 patients, and you can see that there were 20% um, patients with CR or PR, and that the overall survival was 17.8 months. However, it's important to note that patients who have a complete remission on this agent generally are cured. Uh, another regimen that's of great interest is NAB paclitaxel, which is paclitaxel in an albumin nanoparticle, and um, it's combined with uh, uh, avastin bevacizumab, which is an anti-blood vessel drug, and uh, these are the uh, demographics of the patients, and again you can see that there are uh, 32% partial remissions, 44% stable disease, clinical benefit in 80% of the patients. So this is a backup regimen that we use. 
So we have now a new treatment algorithm for melanoma based on the uh, new drugs that have been developed plus information about the old drugs. If the patients are treatment naive and they're in excellent condition and they have mainly pulmonary metastasis, they're eligible for high dose IL-2. We are still looking for the curative agents for melanoma, so a high priority protocol is always indicated. Uh, if their patient has a BRAF mutation and we send all patients for this analysis, they should go on vemurafenib. If not, ipilimumab alone, is, uh, it would be indicated. And for the previously treated patients, uh, uh, you can see the approach uh, given on the bottom of the slide. I'll skip that slide. Um, so how do we monitor the disease in patients receiving ipilimumab? Uh, the clinical trials uh, information is shown here. Clinical trial benefits. Uh, cl clinical trial monitoring is done every 12 weeks. Um, so what are the key takeaways here? Melanoma is increasing dramatically in incidence, and even though we have early detection, uh, we have a rising mortality. So the mortality has increased about 10% in the last few years. We have two new therapies, and this is just the beginning. Melanoma is going to become like breast cancer or lung cancer with many excellent uh, protocols uh, of treatment. Uh, High-dose IL-2 and nabpaclitaxel plus bevacizumab are, are uh, available, the latter only as an experimental therapy at the moment. So a new treatment paradigm for melanoma is now at hand. Should I ask the questions? Okay. So here are some of the uh, post-assessment questions. Which of the following treatments for melanoma are considered immunotherapies? And you can see the list there. Please answer. The correct answer is two and four. Next question is, which of the following possible treatment choices for patients who test for negative for a BRAF mutation? Please answer. And the right answer is, is anything but vemurafenib. And that's it. Thank you very much. OK. We are going to move on to the pre-assessment questions for my section. So patients receiving ipilimumab therapy are at risk for which of the following? Alterations in pituitary hormone production, suppression of ADH production, development of photosensitivity, increased frequency of stools including colitis, all of the above, one, three, and four, or one and four only? One, two, three, four. Which of the following side effects are associated with inhibitors of BRAF? Cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma, photosensitivity, nausea, pruritus, all of the above, none of the above, one, two, and four, or one and two? All right, so starting with ipilimumab, you know, I've been taking care of patients with melanoma since about 1990, very uh, much as uh, a main focus of my practice. And the last couple of years has been very exciting because we've had these newer agents, but they present new challenges for nurses because these are not like your typical chemotherapy drugs. So when we look at ipilimumab, it is a monoclonal antibody. You've heard a lot about this already. It's given as a three mg per kg IV infusion over 90 minutes <coughs> every three weeks for a total of four doses, and that's it. Then the patient is done. 
it comes in two different size vials, and that becomes important as you're determining the dose for the patient based on their weight and how you're going to round that. So important to work with your pharmacist on that. It's to be stored for no more than 24 hours under refrigerated or at room temperatures, and those are listed for you. It is compatible with either normal sealing or D5W. And you want to discard partially used vials and not reuse those. As far as vimurafenib is concerned, it comes in 240 milligram tablets. This again was approved just in August of last year. The recommended dose is four tablets or 960 milligrams twice daily. First dose should be taken in the morning. The second dose, 12 hours later, approximately 12 hours later, as close as they can get to that. Swallow it whole with a glass of water, either with or without a meal. But if they take it with a meal, you want them to always take it with a meal. If they take it without a meal, you encourage them to try and always take it without a meal so you can get consistent blood levels. Should not be crushed or chewed. And if a dose is missed, it can be taken up to four hours prior to the next dose but you shouldn't be having the patient take both doses or all eight pills at the same time. You've heard about the additional regimens. Again, high dose interleukin-2 is given as a 600,000 international units per kilogram dosing as an IV bolus every 15 minutes, typically for up to 14 doses, followed by a week break, and then you repeat that again to the, uh, for the patient. And that's pretty much all the IL-2 most patients will ever receive. There are times when you may repeat that, but that's it. They're going to respond or not respond most uh, often to the, just that one, what we call, cycle of therapy. The chemotherapy regimens have also been included for you as well as part of Dr. Hirsch's discussion. I'm not going to review those again. When we look at IL-2 toxicities, again, this is a fascinating drug. It's an immunotherapy that has a significant toxicity profile, and so it is very important to select the right patients to receive this agent because of the toxicities. They do tend to be dose-dependent, dose-related, schedule-dependent. So the more the patient receives, the more toxicities you're going to see with those patients. So the common toxicities are listed there for you, but the most severe toxicities are related to the capillary leak syndrome that patients experience when they receive IL-2. There are some rare cardiac side effects that can occur with this agent, um, but again, it's, uh, it calls on all of your nursing assessment skills when this drug is being given and all of the nursing management skills to control those toxicities. The side effects are listed here for you as well. Infections, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, fevers and rigors, hypotension, cardiac issues, neurotoxicity, pulmonary edema, and rashes and skin side effects. Interleukin-2 was approved in 1998 for melanoma. It was first approved for kidney cancer in 1992. So this drug has been around for quite a while, and I'm not going to focus on the side effects so much of this drug, but I'd like to get on to the newer agents that are out there that you may be less familiar with. So ipilimumab, when we're treating patients with this drug or talking to patients about receiving this drug, I like to say to them, I'm going to talk to you about the side effects by telling you about the itises, because that's the easiest way, I think, to remember it, and it helps patients remember it as well. So these itises include dermatitis, so the skin toxicity, GI toxicities, enterocolitis, hepatic system, hepatitis, neurologic system, neuritis, the endocrine system, hypophysitis, thyroiditis, and then additionally you can see things like pneumonitis, nephritis, meningitis, pericarditis, uveitis, uh, lots of itises here for our patients to be uh, experiencing. The most common adverse reactions that are seen 5% or more at any grade include diarrhea, rash, fatigue, pruritus, and colitis. So there is a boxed warning, and we'll be talking a little bit more about these side effects, but just to briefly cover what is actually stated in the boxed warning is the severe and fatal immune-mediated adverse reactions due to the T-cell activation that Dr. Hirsch talked about here and proliferation that can occur, and this can involve any organ system, all of those itises I talked to you about. The most common adverse reactions are listed there, as I've already mentioned. Most adverse reactions are initially manifested during treatment, but some of these can occur months after. So especially some of the endocrine side effects. Those may not occur during the treatment, but you may see those months. And I have a patient who it was 18 months after he was treated that he actually developed hypophysitis. Permanently discontinue and initiate systemic high-dose corticosteroid therapies for severe immune-mediated reactions. And you want to make sure that you're always assessing patients for any of these side effects. As far as vimurafenib is concerned, the side effects that we see are arthralgia, rash, nausea, photosensitivity, fatigue, pruritus, 
the hand-foot skin reactions or that palmar plantar dysesthesia, development of squamous cell carcinomas of the keratoacanthoma type. So as we talk about managing toxicities of treatment, you hear a lot of us throwing around these terms, grade one and two toxicity, grade three and four toxicity, most of the toxicities were grade one and two. Well, we use the NCI common toxicity criteria almost solely in clinical trials as far as that's the criteria they always want us to use to describe a reaction, and that's to keep us all on the same page. And so just briefly to cover that for you, grade one is always going to be the, the most minor toxicity, and we don't want to see a grade five toxicity because that means the patient has died from a toxicity of treatment. But as we go along, as we talk about grade one and two toxicities, those are going to be the mild or moderate toxicities that don't tend to have a great impact on patient quality of life, and they can usually tolerate these toxicities. When we get into three and four, those are the more moderate and severe toxicities that really require more in-depth intervention and possibly hospitalization for patients. So those are very, uh, can become very serious toxicities. So we'll look at how we manage these new agent toxicities, uh, specifically dermato dermatologic toxicities right now, rash, vitiligo, pruritus, they had hand, foot, skin reaction, and photosensitivity. So rash. I've kind of divided this up into what we see more with IPI and what we see more with femurafenib. And I say IPI just because it's easier for patients to say too. <laughs> so, and, and this time in the morning, it's easier for me to say it. So with ipilimumab, we have more of those immune-mediated immune re reactions, and so uh, those are the type of rashes. And I don't see usually real severe rashes, but you can see in, this, in the picture here, this was a patient on ipilimumab and the rash on his arm, uh, a very typical type of rash that we see. You often see corticosteroids used more in ipilimumab. And I will tell you as an old, very old IL-2 nurse, and steroids were an absolute no-no. All right, if you give steroids to a patient receiving IL-2, you might as well not give the IL-2 to them because you will turn off the response. That's not the case. That is not what they have seen in the clinical trials with ipilimumab. Patients, if they are having these immune-related adverse events, corticosteroids can be given, and it hasn't been shown to affect the response rate for those patients. Rashes, though, can progress in ipilimumab. Even though I said they tend to be more mild, these can progress to things like a Steven Johnson's syndrome, and so it's very important to monitor for the rash, and if it becomes severe, you have to hold or discontinue it. On the other side with the murafenib, the rashes that we see can be those um, uh, papular pustular rashes where you may actually need to give a patient an antibiotic such as minocycline. For those, you want to do those frequent skin evaluations to assess for the squamous cell carcinomas, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Dermatology referrals can be important for those patients, especially as they de begin to develop those squamous cell cancers. You want them following with the dermatologist to remove those, and you may hold that drug PRN for a rash. Across the board for both of these patient groups, though, you want to have them using emollient creams that don't have an alcohol base, that don't have fragrance in them, that are the creams, not the lotion, because they stay on better, they really protect the skin better. You can give them the antipyritic agents because they may be pyritic rashes. Again, I talked about the steroid creams. It's important to do just those general reminders to patients. Don't get in the hot shower. That's going to exacerbate your rash, and sometimes we forget the easy things to tell patients. Wear loose clothing, avoid any changes in your detergents or your fabric softeners that, that become very difficult for us to tell what is really causing the rash at that point in time, and limiting sun exposure, sunscreen, sunscreen, sunscreen. They should be using it anyway, but remind them to use sunscreen. They're very much photosensitive, especially with femurafenib. It's important to try and grade the rashes, again, using common toxicity criteria so that we're all describing it the same way. And so the person who sees the patient after you has a better understanding of what, how bad was that rash really. Okay, what I see in my world of rashes may be very different than you. So something that looks pretty typical to me, you might think is a severe rash. So we need to try and use common criteria. The hand-foot skin reactions that we see with vimurafenib do mimic somewhat of the, the ones that we see with the TKIs. Um, the patients get the, the thick and patchy hyperkeratoderma uh, seen over their, their balls of their feet. They can sometimes get that out in their hands. On the hands, though, it's typically more redness and blistering, um, uh, sometimes just exquisitely tender hands and feet. It can be very severe as far as the discomfort associated with this, so it's really important that we provide analgesics when patients are having these kind of skin reactions as well. And so um, I tell patients, put gel inserts in your shoes, use the emollient creams on your hands and feet. 
it's sometimes uh, very helpful to get a podiatrist involved, but you, you kind of want to avoid having them whacking off these calluses. You have to be really careful with that. I had a patient who came in and told me that he was using his hand sander on his feet. I said, no, 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 please don't do that. And, you know, you, so you, you'd be surprised what people do. Um, Urea-based creams can be very helpful sometimes with the really thick callusing, so urea uh, does help with that. And then some of the foot soaks, using just warm foot soaks or sometimes throwing in some Epsom salts. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of good evidence-based practice as far as how to manage this particular side effect, and it's a great area for nursing to get more involved. The GI adverse events. These can really be very serious, and so it's extremely important that we do good patient education. Diarrhea, especially with ipilimumab, uh, uh, can become quite severe. It can be seen with vimurafenib, but this is one of the major side effects with IPI that patients have to have really good teaching about. It can rapidly progress to colitis if it's not caught early and treated, so we want to make sure we're looking at what grade of diarrhea a patient has. If they are becoming uh, very symptomatic from this, we're, we're going to see here how we, we have to even hold or stop therapy as a result of this. Sometimes the diarrhea that patients have developed with ipilimumab has continued on well beyond the end of their treatment. It's been reported in up to two years in some patients who develop this particular side effect. So patients who's having seven or more stools per day over their baseline fever, ileus, or peritoneal signs. This is when we're talking about colitis here, all right? And this typically is going to require hospitalization for patients. You usually can't manage this very well in the outpatient setting. Patients may be uh, given IV corticosteroids. In fact, often they're going to receive IV corticosteroids. You may even have to give a patient infliximab, um, bowel rest. Sometimes it can be severe enough that a patient needs to be placed on TPN in order to maintain their nutritional status. In severe unrelenting cases, some, this was during clinical trials with this agent, uh, patients were given tacro or serolomus to try and stop the reaction, and even a ileostomy or diverting colostomy may have to be, or colectomy rather, may be considered. Discontinuation again of therapy for patients who develop the severe enterocolitis. And remember, this is an IV agent, so once you've given the drug, it's there. So you're going to be dealing with those side effects, and it's not like a pill that you can just stop taking, and then the half-life uh, completes, and you're, you're on your way. All right, the autoimmune hepatitis is another one of those itises that we can see. 20% of patients developed transaminitis in, when they were being treated with the anti-CTLA-4 antibodies. This can be uh, severe, but that was very uh, low percentage of patients that developed the severe hepatitis. Liver biopsies show a diffuse lymphocytic infiltrate in those patients who were on trial and had biopsies done. If it's grade 3 or higher, you're going to discontinue therapy. Again, the oral cord corticosteroids. You may require hospitalization in those patients who develop a severe hepatitis. And always checking LFTs and bilies before patients receive their treatment. The endocrinopathies, again, about 15% of patients in the phase 3 study develop hypothyroidism. And again, those typical symptoms that you see with hypothyroidism in patients are going to be the same type of symptoms. Hyperthyroidism was also seen, but to a much lesser extent. Anybody who becomes hyperthyroid is ultimately going to become hypothyroid as they burn out their thyroid. The hypophysitis, that inflammation of the pituitary gland, patients get the headache, fatigue, decreased libido, um, all kinds of uh, symptoms. They may have changes in their visual fields. You may see decreased cortisol levels, decreased testosterone, decreased ATCTH. And the radiographic studies oftentimes will show uh, enlargement of the pituitary, so you're going to get cella-specific CT scans or MRIs of the brain really to look at that. Again, this shows you you're going to try and replace the deficient hormones in those patients who develop this. You can also see those ocular toxicities, some of the neurologic toxicities like myopathies. There was a case of Guillain-Barre reported in the clinical trials, and some of those general toxicities like fatigue, anorexia, cough, anemia, and headaches. So again, your lab evaluations, it's just important to do a really good laboratory profile on these patients, looking at LFTs, looking at uh, just their baseline labs with CBCs, looking at electrolytes. So we're going to be monitoring those in both groups of patients. With vimurab, uh, vimurafenib, it's especially important that they do have the BRAF testing done because this agent is not effective if patients don't have the, the BRAF mutation, if their tumor does not, not the patient, the tumor has a BRAF mutation. So that's always got to be evaluated before 
patient is placed on this particular agent. Again, especially with vimurafenib, checking the LFTs periodically, and also EKGs with vimurafenib. Drug-drug interactions, we really don't know of any specific ones with IPI, with vimurafenib, those SIP substrates, again, something that 100 years ago in nursing school we didn't know anything about metabolic pathways. Now we know that m many of our oral agents have a, um, their effectiveness changed and altered by the concomitant medications that patients are taking, so very important to get those concomitant med profiles with your patients and making sure that we don't have any drug interactions. You're going to discontinue IPI when a patient has those severe reactions. So I'm, this is on your USB drive. I'm not going to go through all of this. But anytime there's a moderate severe reaction, you've got to look at holding the drug, discontinuing the drug. All right, same thing with vimurafenib. If the patient is only having mild toxicity, you may be able to push through and continue administration. If they start developing grade 3 and 4, or even grade 2 that are intolerable toxicities, that's when you're going to need to hold the agent, let them get back down to baseline, and then consider redosing at a, a lower dose for that patient to see how they tolerate it. Patient education is extremely important. You want to make sure that the patients understand that these drugs are different than regular chemotherapy. Help them understand the side effects that they may be experiencing with these. Get your plan together. Start your teaching with these patients. Make sure patients understand that when they are experiencing a side effect, who they're supposed to call. There's got to be 24-7 availability for somebody uh, to answer patient questions. These can be very scary reactions and side effects that patients have. So they have to have somebody they can call, and they need to know when to call, what's important, what do you need to report. Patients sometimes will blow off diarrhea, not when they're in ipilimumab. That first episode of diarrhea, they've got to start taking something for that. All right, very, very important. And they've got to know what the threshold is, when, how many stools in a day with the use of something like Imodium that's not becoming effective, when do they call the health care provider and not just keep taking more Imodium? So really, really important. Some of the patient education challenges we face. So with ipilimumab, the effect of the treatment is on the immune system, not directly targeting the tumor. That's a little bit of a jump for patients, helping them understand that. And if they understand that, it makes it a little bit easier for them to understand why responses can be delayed, why you're not going to see that immediate shrinkage of tumor necessarily. So that's important. The vast side effect profile with this agent. So again, that's a challenge, making sure that they understand all the potential things that can happen and giving them that education. The variability in response to treatment, how you may sometimes see tumor progression while they're on treatment before you see tumor responses. That's very unusual, and that's something that if uh, any of you are used to doing clinical trials, tumor progression during treatment, Take the patient off study, it's ineffective. That's not the case with ipilimumab. Delayed responses are often seen with this drug. And it's four treatments in the FDA-approved therapy. In the clinical trials, they were doing some maintenance therapies in some of those trials. The FDA has approved those four treatments once every three weeks and done. With vimurafenib therapy, some of the challenges we face, what is BRAF? Helping, helping patients understand that their tumor is going to be evaluated for a BRAF mutation and why they shouldn't receive that drug if, they don't, if their tumor does not carry that mutation. The patient thinks, do I have a genetic mutation? And that's why I like to emphasize it's the tumor. And yes, it is four pills twice a day. That's a lot of pills for some patients to take, especially if you're like me and you don't like to swallow pills. So I'm helping them understand, yes, it is four pills twice a day. You have one skin cancer, but we're going to treat you with something that may cause another skin cancer. And that's a little bit frightening for somebody with a melanoma diagnosis. And so helping them understand what the, the squamous cells are, that they typically are not invasive cancers, this keratoacanthoma type, we'll get them to a dermatologist, have those removed. And does this cure my cancer? That's a very important question. And no, it does not cure the patient's cancer. And so talking to patients about what we expect with this, and yes, you may get a very quick response with femurafenib, as Dr. Hirsch indicated, but that response typically is anywhere from six to eight months in, on average for patients. Some, it can be years that they get the response. Others, they may have a response only for uh, a couple of months, and then their tumor progresses. So these are the important educational challenges. All right, so let's look at these uh, questions that I asked you before I started. Patients receiving ipilimumab therapy are at risk for which of the following? Alterations in pituitary hormone production, suppression of ADH, development of photosensitivity, increased frequency of stools, including colitis, 
All of the above, just one, three, and four, or one in four. Okay, so actually one, three, and four, uh, we really don't have any uh, indications that ADH is altered here. Which of the following side effects are associated with inhibitors of BRAF, the cutaneous squamous cells, photosensitivity, nausea, pruritus, all of the above, none of the above, one, two, and four, or one and two? Okay, so all of the above wins on that one. Very good. All right, I'm going to turn this over to Krista as we talk, look at some case studies and get all of you involved. Good morning, everybody. So we're going to do um, a bit of a bit of a, a different approach right here to talk about uh, the case studies just to make it a little bit more practical and for you to meet your neighbors. So what I want you to do is at each table I want you to assign a moderator. I'm going to have 10 minutes. Well, actually I'm going to try to make it six or seven minutes because we're short for time this morning. And I want you to look at the cases that are on your table, which is the green sheet. There are four different cases. I want you to read the case and kind of figure out what the salient points are. For those of you at a single table, you may want to join another table. Okay, so you're going to have about six minutes, so there's got to be a team leader, a moderator at each table. Okay, we're going to start wrapping it up. You have about uh, 15 seconds left. Okay. Now, I, I heard some feedback in the audience as I was walking through that people said, I have no idea what to, uh, what to write, and that's okay. So hopefully you'll learn something uh, today. So, who in the room, which tables, by show of hands, has case number one? All right. So, do that again. Okay. You just got to be the lucky lady of the day. Why don't you stand up for us and just give us a couple salient points. Actually, you know what? Give me one second. I'm going to read through this quickly, quickly, quickly. 30-year-old man. For those of you that was, were at the um, benchside lecture, this may look a little familiar. Um, it's, it's kind of based on, on a similar patients. A 30-year-old gentleman with a history of a stage 2 melanoma, did not have any adjuvant therapy, was not recommended. Two years later, presents with um, very symptomatic recurrent disease. He subsequently has uh, a, um, para, excuse me, a thoracentesis, which was also used to, actually maybe not in this case, I think I changed it. Um, okay, so he gets worked up, blah, 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 I'm not going to go through the whole thing. So he has progressive disease because we see increase in size of the known tumors, new bilateral pleural masses, lymphadenopathy, well-controlled asthma as part of his past medical history, a current history, social history, et cetera, et cetera. So the question was, what treatment options would be discussed and what would be recommended and why? Young lady. Okay. okay um, our first thing that we wanted to do was to check his uh, BRAF status. Excellent. And if it was positive, we would discuss with this patient the VRAP inhibitor as an option. Um, also to discuss the other drug, IPI, but we thought we would rule out IL-2 due to the patient's asthma history. Oh, you guys paid attention yesterday. That makes me so proud. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Excellent. Thank you. If I had a gold star, I'd put it right on your forehead. That was excellent. Okay. So with this patient, treatment options. Of course, clinical trials, again, NCCN recommends clinical trials as the first option, immunotherapies, 
including IPI and high-dose IL-2, the targeted therapies, BRAF inhibitors, and standard chemotherapy is still an option for a certain percentage of patients. And then an option is always best support of care, and we are obligated to talk to patients about all treatment options, and that is, that is certainly something that should be considered. So. Given this patient's rapid progression of disease, it would be recommended to get uh, do BRAF analysis. So this patient had a biopsy of the pleural met, which showed this patient to be BRAF wild type, so did not have the BRAF V600E mutation. So the recommendation was for ipilimumab. He was in otherwise good health, young age. There was a little concern, as our wonderful uh, young lady pr um, pointed out, that um, IL-2 may be a little bit risky in the sense that this patient was dependent on inhaled steroids <clears throat> for management of asthma. And the IPI was thought to give, to give, to be, um, give this patient the best chance for a durable response. So one week later, after insurance approvals, this patient did go on to start IPI. So great. Um, patient tolerated the first infusion quite well, no issues. Follow-up labs were notable only for an increase in LFTs, which were grade one. Second infusion, again, you always want to check uh, labs prior. Unremarkable, he was starting to become a little bit more symptomatic, having O2 sats now a little bit lower, also having some mild pruritus. Labs were stable, his fatigue was starting to worsen a little bit, could be disease, could be ippy. Third infusion, starting to notice an elevation in the amylase lipase. As Peg mentioned, the itises, so when we see an amylase and lipase elevation, we start thinking about pancreatitis. LFTs are now normal, no abdominal complaints, so not too suspicious for a pancreatitis. His dyspnea was starting to improve a little bit. Paritis was being well managed with uh, moisturizers, and his fatigue was stable. Fourth infusion, um, labs normal, dyspnea stable, actually a little better at 96%. He's got some little red bumps all around, paritis, but manageable, and fatigue is improving. So he gets his four dose, he's completed his induction IPI. CT scans obtained four weeks from the time of the last dose, because remember, you're not always going to see a response very quickly. This is immunotherapy, you tend to see responses later. So earliest we would obtain is usually four weeks. So patient scans show minor regression of the lymphadenopathy and no new lesions. So then we wait six weeks later, patient's pretty stable, we get some more scans, no new lesions, patient continues to have slow but clear clinical response with improved symptoms, now five months from his last dose. So that was a great, that was a great day in clinic. Okay, which tables in the room had case two? Nobody's going to raise their hair now because I know I'm going to pick on them. See? All right. My dear, let me go through it quickly, and then I'm going to pick on you. So this is PL is a 50-year-old male, past medical history notable for hypertension and anxiety. Who doesn't have anxiety now in 2012? Social history, married to adult children. He's a respiratory therapist, non-smoker, social drinker, negative for melanoma. His meds are uh, listed, allergy to aspirin. Presents to his local dermatologist with a bleeding and changing mole. Biopsy demonstrates a two millimeter ulcerated superficial spreading melanoma of the left lateral trunk. Eight mitoses. Hmm, red flag for me. He underwent wide excision and sentinel node evaluation. The, um, he drained to both left groin and, oh, that, yeah, left groin and left axilla. You can have two different draining nodal basins. Final path, zero nodes involved, no residual melanoma. So it was ultimately a stage 2A. Similar to the patient that we, I just demonstrated as well, 2A melanomas are very, very common. So now I will turn to this table here in front. What treatment options would be discussed, and uh, what would you recommend? Um, actually, yes, this is a 2B. Is that accurate? Stage uh, 2B? He, I think he was, a, he was a 2A with high-risk features. Oh, OK. Anything high-risk features, I think you'd consider um, adjuvant interferon or surveillance, depending on the patient's preference, possibly a clinical trial. Very good. So we both mentioned high-risk features. I will highlight this eight mitoses. Mitotic rate of eight, once it's over one, it's not really, it's either kind of like you're pregnant, it's either positive or negative, you are or you're on. 
There's no, you're really, really pregnant, you're really, really, really <laughs> pregnant. But if you see high mitotic rate, that insinuates an aggressive lesion. So even though this is deemed a 2A melanoma, having a high mitotic rate makes it a higher risk patient or higher risk for uh, recurrence because it implies an aggressive melanoma. So you picked up on that, good for you. So in this case, treatment options for a 2A melanoma observation or a clinical trial. There really are not a lot of clinical trials for 2A melanoma at this time. Um, and you were right on it, table two here. So at the time that this patient was seen, there actually was a clinical trial. It was an ECOG trial, an intergroup trial, looking at whether or not if you could give just a month of high-dose interferon for this lower risk population of patients, would it make a difference compared to observation? In other words, for a, for a lower risk patient population, if you only gave an abbreviated course of induction interferon, would that reduce their risk of relapse? Fortunately, it turned out to be a negative trial, but at the time, the patient enrolled on that. He was randomized to receive interferon. Week two, he did experience grade three nausea, had a couple doses held, dose reduced, and he ended up completing the full 20 doses. He was followed regularly as per protocol and as per our standard. Two years later, he notices a lump in the shower in his left axilla. He comes in for evaluation. Physician saw him, no, appreciated the two centimeter rubbery mobile node. So usually if melanomas recur, they tend to be firm and hard. So this was mm, not so big and it was, it was rubbery. So the plan was to just reevaluate in a month. Patient comes back a month later. It's now a wee bit bigger. Went ahead and obtained a um, fine needle aspirate the same day, which was positive for melanoma. So now two years later, this patient with 2A melanoma with high risk features has recurred. We go ahead and stage him which shows the uh, enlarged axillary node. Otherwise, he was uh, without evidence of disease. He went on to have an axillary node dissection. The pathology comes back positive for melanoma in one node, large node, four centimeters. And this ECE stands for extracapsular extension. So the melanoma kind of grew outside of the capsule of the lymph node. Think of it as like a grape. And the grape skin keeps the grape juice in. If there is a little tear in the skin of the grape, you can have some grape juice leak out. That's the same theory with extracapsular extension. So if it leaks out, you're worried about there being recurrence into the local area. So since this patient had been randomized to the interferon arm of the clinical trial, he was not eligible. We would not consider re, um, restarting interferon on him. So he subsequently went on to have radiation to, the, um, to that lymph node. Basin. Okay. Who in the room has table three? You really will get a prize if you raise your hand. Who has case three? <laughs> One brave woman back there. All right. So as the mic's coming over to you, I'll get started here. So this is the same patient from case one. This is our 30-year-old lovely gentleman. So I'm going to skip right through here because this is the same history. So again, I'll remind you, he's, he, had, he tolerated his induction of IPI. He had scans that were looking pretty good. So at third set of scans, this patient now has small but clear progression of the pleural, ba a pleural base nodule, and now brain MRI demonstrates a four millimeter cerebellar met. This is a classic presentation for patients. No edema, patient remained asymptomatic, probably would be from a four millimeter cerebellar met at that size. Slight increase in cough, but overall his respiratory status was stable, doing pretty well. So in this particular case, young lady in the back there, what did you guys recommend, table three? We need the mic on. You want to just stand up and yell? It's New Orleans. <laughs> Is there a clinical trial? Excellent. All right. And then um, since he was asymptomatic, um, we're given the option to observe until there's something to monitor. OK. Um, so you're saying observe the brain met? No, he was. Didn't he get treatment for that? Nope, not yet. Uh, on the second page, he gets treatment. <laughs> well, you've had your coffee this morning. Yes. Okay. Three cups. <laughs> All right, keep going. I'm liking what you're saying. <laughs> All right, so he got his brain met treated. Okay. On the second page. <laughs> and then, if there's something, um, then when the next thing pops up, if he's. If there's, a, if there's no clinical trial, then you would offer systemic therapy, observe, supportive care. 
Okay. I don't know if you reinduce with Ippy again. Oh, I don't know. Are, you are primed and ready there for my next case. Okay. <laughs> All right, that was great. And you know what? Everything you said is right. It depends on which institution you're going to go to, which physician you're going to see. There's no, at this point in time, there's no um, standard algorithm for managing these patients. So it really depends on, on a lot of factors, but you bring up a lot of, a lot of good points. So I'm going to have you recall this patient is BRAF wild type. He has a new brain met. He's young, no other comorbidities. So decision was made to proceed with stereotactic radiosurgery, which is gamma knife, just a, a different technical term. So it's the focused radiation to the particular spot. Remember, this is a four millimeter cerebellar met. Um, systemic, systemically now, he initially responded to IPI, if you recall. And though this is considered off-label, there is data supporting that for patients that initially have a response to IPI, that, and then progress, those are the potentially best population of patients to actually reinduce. So they would actually go on to get another four doses. Now again, it's off-label, that's not the FDA approval, but there is data supporting that. Um, and I, I put that out there. So going on with this, SRS was administered in a single session. It was a small size, little risk of seizure. Um, did well, and a six-week follow-up MRI was scheduled. After his first week of SRS, the decision was prior, prior made to go ahead and reinduce because he did, he did well. Um, so he tolerated, tolerated the re, first dose of reinduction. Second dose of reinduction, Ippy was held for a grade three amylase and lipase. And if you recall, he had a little bump in his amylase and lipase before. You tend to kind of see recurring um, toxicity sometimes. But again, no pancreatitis. Labs were repeated biweekly just to ensure that they weren't going up and up and up and did resolve to a grade one uh, prior to the third infusion. So sometimes these things do resolve on their own. We follow these patients extraordinarily closely when they have brain metastasis with MRIs every four to six weeks. So this patient had an MRI showing a response to SRS and no new lesions. That's, that's another good day in clinic. So we went on to receive his fourth dose without further toxicity, again, remained stable. But then his cough starts to get a little bit worse. So we went ahead and got a chest CT a week later, which showed stable disease, no new lesions, possible that he was having some inflammatory reaction from the IPI causing or teasing the, um, the nodes, causing him to have a little cough. That happens often. So given what I just mentioned, there would be other options as the lady back there who paid attention to me uh, mentioned. So at every institution, it could be very different. Some would think about CNS progression, even though it was stable in the body, to think, well, that means it's not well controlled in the body. So would we go on and give some other type of therapy, chemotherapy, chemobiotherapy, observation, as mentioned. And in this case, we often just observe these patients to see if they're going to have a later and later response. Hospice is always an alternative as well. There are many folks that um, would put a patient like this on hospice right away. We tend not to do that. But so again, no right or wrong thing. This is an example of what we did for this patient or what was done at a different institution. Okay, we're getting there. I talk really fast. I'm from Boston. I have a lot of coffee. So let's See who's got table four, one brave woman in the front. All right, table four, excuse me, it was case four. So I'm going to read it again, and then as the mic is coming over to you. So there is a theme here. Mr. PL is back. This is our case two, our 50-year-old gentleman. I've already gone through this history. Recall he was on a clinical trial for a stage 2A disease, got a month of interferon. He then recurs in his lymph node. He gets a dissection, but because he had had prior interferon, we radiated him. So here's where the story starts. I know this is a very busy slide, I apologize. So one month after his radiation to the axillary basin is completed, he called to report back pain. He thought he pulled a muscle. Again, he was a respiratory therapist. We as healthcare providers are not good patients. We don't like to uh, complain. So this gentleman just thought he pulled a, um, a muscle. He had a very, very severe pain and really couldn't walk, but he just thought he, he had a little, a little back problem. He had an um, L-spine MRI, which showed, unfortunately, diffuse bony mats with a destructive lesion at L4. Pathological fracture, 
and extensive surrounding edema and enhancement. No wonder this guy couldn't walk. CTs also obtained showing a splenic lesion, new liver lesions uh, that were questionable, new multiple bilateral pulmonary nodules, the largest being about 1.3 centimeters. Brain MRI looked okay. Given the degree of pain that he was having, we just started, uh, the decision was made to just go ahead with palliative XRT, which could be very, very good at reducing pain. So that was planned, and at the time, uh, BRAF status was, was being evaluated. So BRAF status came back right about the time he completed the radiation to his back. He was BRAF E600 E mutant. Uh, there were some problems getting the drug right away because of insurance issues. He subsequently needed a readmission for intractable pain and nausea. So while he was in the hospital, they were able to get the drug. It was delivered to his house. His wife brought it in. He started on the VEM while in house, so the VEMURAFINIB, the BRAF inhibitor. He did ultimately, ultimately require some more procedures to the back to manage his pain while, while there. And he was able to uh, start the VEM, and within a few days, he was feeling much, much, much better. So he went home. He did have an implantable, um, he had an implantable pain pump to help manage some of the back pain, and he was able to go home on vemurafenib. An interval scan showed stable disease on VEM, so that's good because, again, this patient seems to have pretty aggressive melanoma. He's very, he'd been very symptomatic, so we didn't want to go too long without getting a scan. But unfortunately, repeat imaging demonstrated progression with new brain mets. The brain MRI showed small but multiple new brain mets, the largest being only six millimeters. So table four, where are you? Okay. What would be the next step at your institution? Well, we have Ta, Rachel, and myself, Karen. Um, we would be, uh, we would want to ensure that he does have social help for any financial problems. Mm -hmm. um, make sure that he has all that information. Um, we're going to give uh, uh, the, the eye drug. Ippy. <laughs> the Ippy. And um, we're going to uh, do supportive care. Okay. And you're giving like, Ippy for the brain mat? Yeah. Okay. Okay, good, good answers. I, I congratulate all my peers for being able to think so clearly this I early. Know. This is early in the, in the morning. morning. Okay, thank you, good points. So treatment option. Well, he's got a brain med, as I mentioned. Did you want to say something? No, okay. Um, so the question would be, I'm going to just pop back to the brain mat. So he's got multiple new small brain mats, largest being six millimeters. So the question would be, given that there are multiple, unlike our other cases who've had one small brain mat, so this patient has multiple brain mats. Do we think about whole brain? Do we just SRS? Those four, now there are some centers that will SRS up to 11 lesions in the brain. Um, there are disadvantages to whole brain XRT. There are disadvantages to SRS, and there's pros and cons as to both. So really got to have a discussion with that. Systemic options, chemo, immuno, best supportive care. So after much discussion, a treatment plan was established to pursue IPI on this patient for the following reasons. CNS disease was small, but the patient was asymptomatic. That's really important. Given multiple sites, whole brain XRT would be recommended versus SRS, it doesn't really make sense, does it? And here's the, here's the catch. There's data supporting CNS effect with IPI. Two years ago at ASCO, Donald Lawrence presented a, or had an abstract showing that there is CNS penetration with IPI. So at some institutions, what folks will do if the brain mets are small, asymptomatic, they may go ahead and start the IPI because, again, there's a small window to get ipilimumab in get an immunotherapy in, and then perhaps if there, is, if there is progression of the CNS disease, they will then go ahead and treat. You can, you can always give SRS. It's, it's in one day. So there needs to be discussion about those types of things. It's not an FDA-approved therapy for brain metastasis, but there is data suggesting, and we know that there are patients, and there was a large clinical trial demonstrating that there is efficacy in the CNS. So certainly something to consider. So the patient went on to receive IPI. We, for for when, for gone, didn't give the, the, um, the CNS treatment, went ahead with the IPI, and remained on four milligrams of dexamethasone for nausea. Discussion points. So dexamethasone and IPI. Well, you've heard 
hopefully numerous times now that typically with immunotherapy we don't like to give steroids. Peg made this point earlier as, as I didn't like that you said an old IL-2 yeah. nurse, but an experienced IL-2 nurse. Um, we, we never, never gave steroids when somebody was getting immunotherapy. And Decadron is a great, great anti-nausea medicine this patient needed it. What's very interesting and was new to all of us in oncology that deal with melanoma is with ipilimumab, there does not seem to be any decrease in the efficacy of the response, the anti-CTLA-4 response, when you use steroids. So that was very, very different. So we feel good about being able to give these patients steroids. But we also have to think about, okay, what's the likelihood of this patient progressing in the CNS? So we kind of needed to have a plan for CNS progression and also a plan for systemic, pro systemic progression. So, I have three minutes left on my timer. So what we'd like to do, um, is I know we went through those cases, there was a lot of points, a lot of issues. At this point in time, in 2012, there is no standard algorithm for how to manage these patients. But for the first time in a long time, or actually the first time ever, we actually have a menu for treatment options with what we can do with these patients. So what would be really helpful now is to write down your questions on those cards that were on the table. We already have some up here, and the panel members, we are happy to answer some of these questions, clarify some points, and I think, Peg, you already have one that you want to start with, and then Dr. Hirsch as well. So we have, um, can we turn on, thank you. So we have a couple of questions already that we'll start with here, and feel free to raise your hand if you have a question, and Keith will pick this up from you and bring it up to us. So the uh, first question I have is, what percent of melanoma patients have primary lesions? Uh, I'll probably try and answer this more backwards. Uh, if you look at the data, varying data, roughly 5 to 10 percent of patients will have melanomas of an unknown primary. So they, they, we are never able to find an actual primary lesion. And I'm, I'm talking about cutaneous melanoma right now, not oculars. I, Dr. Hirsch has a question. I, I first have a comment on case number. Is this on? Yeah. I first have a com comment on case number four. Case number four, yes. I have two patients who have had brain metastases after ipilimumab treatment sometime before and they were reinduced, and both had complete remission of their brain metastases. So that's a very good strategy. The only thing I'd say is you have, have to watch them very, very, very closely. So we, we get, on those patients, we get an MRI of the brain every four weeks. So my first question is, what would be the current treatment for stage one or two, apparently localized melanoma after surgery? So I'm going to assume that in these patients, if a sentinel lymph node biopsy was indicated, it was done and it was negative, because if it had been positive, they would have gone on to have a lymph node dissection. So for both of these patients with a negative sentinel lymph node biopsy, observation would certainly be uh, an appropriate approach. Observation only, watchful waiting. Um, <clears throat> If there's, a, if there's an open clinical trial for the stage two patients, they could certainly be entered on that. And there are ongoing and planned clinical trials in the adjuvant setting for both ipilimumab and uh, for vemurafenib. Uh, and uh, I think, of course, the patient should go on a clinical trial if they're eligible and they agree to do so. The second question is, is it common for the surgical site to demonstrate delayed healing? If not, what could that possibly mean? I, I think it means if, if yes, what could that possibly mean? At any rate, delayed healing is, is very uncommon, except under the circumstances where a skin graft has had to be placed over the uh, surgical site where it's somewhat more common. Uh, we generally don't use skin grafting anymore in most patients because the size of the excision is smaller uh, than was done in previous years. Uh, but delayed healing would indicate some other underlying disease, uh, poor nutrition, diabetes, or if the primary site is in a place where there's poor circulation, like on the distal lower extremity in somebody who has um, a peripheral vascular disease. Okay, I have a question here. Krista, 
Thank you for using my name. What number mitotic rate equals aggressive IE range? So the question is, when I made the comment about that mitotic rate of eight, where is the line that would be considered um, aggressive? So in the staging as of 2010, we now look at mitotic rate because mitotic rate is, is an indicator of uh, aggressiveness. We like it to be zero, telling us it's a boring lesion, a boring melanoma that's not really active. So it's zero or one. Anything greater than one is considered to have a mitotic rate. So if you have something that's 10, 8, 15, I've seen 27, those are extraordinarily aggressive melanomas. So really, by definition, by AJCC staging, it's one or greater. Um, but there is, that is not captured in the staging. The only time that mitotic rate is used in the staging is for thin lesions when you're trying to decide whether or not you're going to stage them as a 1A or a 1B. If they have a mitotic rate for a lesion that's under a millimeter, it will upstage them to the higher stage number. So I hope that's clear. If not, I'm happy to talk to the person after. And then why is family history notable for negative for pancreatic cancer? When I do a history on my patients, I ask them, is there any family history of melanoma or pancreatic cancer? Family history of a melanoma increases somebody's risk of having a melanoma. Number one risk factor for melanoma is a personal history of melanoma. Second is a family history of melanoma. The reason I ask about pancreatic cancer is because in the rare, rare, rare subset of patients that have the genetic form of melanoma, if we see a high number of family members that have pancreatic cancer and melanoma, we think about a mutated gene. We think about the genetic form of melanoma. It's the same gene that's mutated for melanoma as in, as in pancreatic cancer. Also, in terms of genetics, women who are BRCA2 positive have a significantly statistical increased risk of developing melanoma, about 40-fold. So there are some genetic um, tendencies there. Good questions. Okay, I had a question about uh, rash. If rash develops, what lotion or moisturizer would be recommended? So I do tend to differentiate between lotion and creams, and creams are preferable because of the, uh, the ability to stain. So I, and I don't have stock in any of these, by the way. So I tend to recommend Eucerin cream or um, Cetaphil. Also, I use that quite a bit with my patients, and there are certainly others, but make sure that they don't have an alcohol base or fragrance in them. That, that becomes a problem. And the second part of this was, when would there be a time dexamethasone should be ordered for what side effect? Well, again, if the patient is having a severe uh, toxicity with their skin, then that's a time where you may need to use a steroid. And certainly with patients who are developing severe diarrhea or even uh, really moderate diarrhea that you're having a difficult time controlling, you may want to initiate dexamethasone in those patients, uh, particularly with ipilimumab. Dr. Hirsch? When would interferon be given? Uh, interferon is approved for the adjuvant therapy of high-risk melanoma. It's generally offered to patients who have uh, stage three disease after removal of the uh, metastatic disease in the lymph node bearing areas. So stage three NED is where it's usually offered. It's clear that um, adjuvant interferon therapy uh, prolongs progression-free survival. It remains controversial as to whether it prolongs overall survival. There are European studies now which are being confirmed in ongoing studies that if the patient's primary was ulcerated, it probably also prolongs overall survival, but only in that circumstance. Consequently, it is offered to patients, but if there's a clinical trial available, uh, that would be uh, much preferred. So the trial which is active now in the United States is ipilimumab versus interferon. Uh, that trial has been done and completed in Europe already, and there are planned trials for vemurafenib uh, as adjuvant therapy as well. So I think over the next three or four years, obviously it takes a long time to do an adjuvant study, but over the next three or four years, it's very likely that we'll see additions to our armamentarium of adjuvant therapy for melanoma. We have a couple more questions, but I was just asked to remind you, for the green sheets that are the cases, please leave those on the tables. Okay. Peg, you want to answer? Yeah, so I think we'll do um, maybe one or two more 
questions and end here. Um, I was asked, uh, is what's the cost and is it covered by Medicare? So, uh, cost of ipilimumab for the four therapies is one hundred and twenty thousand dollars, and. Um, that doesn't include your infusion costs and other costs associated with that. That's for the drug. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Vemuraf and Epigenol will de depend somewhat on wholesale prices, but uh, the last patient that I ordered this for, the cost was $12,000 for their month of therapy. Uh, okay, so I have a, one final question here regarding case study two. Patient had a history of anxiety. How did he do with the interferon with the, risk of, with the increased risk of depression? and mental changes. So excellent question. With one month of interferon, we tend not to see that. The interferon-induced in, um, depression tends to happen later. It's not, if you see depression within the first month of therapy, it's not interferon-related in my experience. There have been cases of interferon-induced mania or um, other uh, usually undiagnosed mental disorders, but being on a m month of interferon would not really, it's not long enough to induce the depression. In terms of anxiety, we pretty much use Ativan for everybody, staff, patients, family, um, because it really is a great drug. One, they can be used sublingual, but also it's good for sleep, anxiety, and nausea. So we use a lot of Ativan. Uh, and again, it's a one-month period of time, short period of time, so, so it tends to work well. Other institutions, whatever is formulary, but, but lorazepam is a great drug. And any changes to his medication to control his anxiety? I think I answered that with the, with the lorazepam. So I think that's it, right? So we want to thank you very much for attending this morning and, and participating with us.